Hey guys, Toby Mathis here, and today we're going to talk about the number one, the numero uno tax deduction for real estate investors. And here's the thing about it. This is the one that most accountants miss. And when I say most, I mean about 90% plus. I'm not misstating that. I've been doing this for over 25 years. I'm a tax attorney by trade. What I do is I'm an investor, hundreds of properties that I, that I own with, with, with one business partner or solo. And this is what I do. And when you do something, you start to learn the nuances of it. So a lot of accountants go through, they go to school, they go to the college course, and they go to a firm, and they're working on what they see. And if they don't see it, chances are they don't know the nuances of it. So a lot of them just don't see real estate investors or small business or uh, traders, things like that. And so they miss some of the nuances that exist. And let me just give you an example. If I went, walked into a home, let's say I was buying a single family residence. So I went to, uh, I'm here in Las Vegas right now. And let's say that a typical Las Vegas home, let's just say 350. And let's say I walked into that home and I'll just play with some numbers here. Let's just say I walked into that, walked into that property, not trashed or anything like that, looking pretty good, walk in there. And I'm just going to stop and I'm going to use my eyeballs to see some things. In fact, I'm even going to backtrack it. Let's say I'm driving up and I park in the street and I walk up to the property and I look around. And so I'm going to visualize seeing a property. All right. So, hey, this is a little bit of a Mediterranean look. It's got stucco and it's got some tile roof. That's great. Hey, look great. You know, it's got some fake grass out, out there. It's got a few palm trees and it's got some nice little shrubberies that, that somebody planted along the home. Let's just say I walk up, here's the new driveway. Boy, that looks great. There's a little walkway that takes you to the front door. I go around back, there's a fence. It's a, uh, they use a lot of block fencing out here, so they use cinder blocks. So I walk around that, I look in the backyard. Hey, look, it's just been graded. There's some decorative rock, which believe it or not, we do desert, desert landscaping out here. There's some cacti. There's all this stuff. I look around. I don't see a pool. Whew, I don't want that pool, right, if I'm going to make it a rental. I'm going to look around, and I'm just going to say, okay, I, I see that. Let me go into the house. Let's say the back door is open. So I, I walk in, and hey, look, there's some great new cabinets that were put up in the, the kitchen. The floor is this nice, let's just say it's, it's manufactured uh, pretend hardwood. So maybe it's a laminate. Maybe it's a hardwood on top. Whatever the case, it's a really, it's a, you know, it's really tough flooring, and then there's some carpet. I walk on in, and uh, as I'm walking through the home, I notice a few other things, that there's some nice cabinets that they, that they put in throughout the home, some nice little nooks and crannies where they can put things. I walk around, it's three bedroom, two bath, and I'm feeling pretty excited uh, as, I, as I walk through the front door, and I say, but this is a great investment for me. Now, most accountants would look at that, and let's just say you walked up to them and you said, all right, what did you pay for the home? Let's just say I spent 350000 The first analysis they're going to do is, what is the home? Uh, it's a rental. Oh, it's single family residence. So single family residence, and this is what's called residential real estate. And they're going to immediately go, you know what? I know residential real estate. We depreciate that over 27 and a half years. You with me so far? What they're saying is we get to write off a portion of that purchase price over 27 and a half years. What the heck does that even mean? They call it depreciation. Well, here's what it means. You take the purchase price with all your closing costs and everything else. For our purposes, I'm just going to call it 350, but it's going to be some number, some weird number because it does include your closing costs. Well, let's just say it's 350 and you subtract off your land. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that minus our land. So here, I'm just gonna get rid of this for right now. I'm just gonna call that 27 and a half. We'll remember that. But we're gonna subtract off minus the land. Oops. And let's just say that our land is $75,000. We look at our assessor's page and we do the ratio and we figure out that, you know what, the land is $75,000. So we're just gonna subtract off our land. That gives us the improvement value. So the depreciable value that we get to write off over 27 and a half years 
would be 275. Very exciting stuff, right? So it doesn't work quite this way, but let's just say you divided that by, you know, I'm just gonna say divide that by 27 and a half, which is gonna equal about $10,000 a year. Very, like you're like, okay, cool. I get to write off $10,000 a year, no matter what, even if I finance this purchase, I get to write it off over that period of time. That's what most accounts, 90% of the accountants are gonna do that. And the way it works is really simple. You know, let's just say that I'm renting it for 3,000 a month. Let's just multiply that by 12 and uh, whatever that is, uh, 36,000 is our gross. We're gonna have costs, let's just say 18,000. I'm just gonna use the rule, you know, the rule of 50%. You're gonna have expenses, management fees, property taxes, insurance, repairs, all that stuff. And let's just say that you made $18,000 net. You're gonna to get to take that $10,000 of depreciation off and you're only gonna pay tax on $8,000, right? So it looks good. Hey, I only have to pay tax on 8,000 even though I have $18,000 sitting in my bank account. Capiche? That's why people like real estate. But I don't want you to pay tax on that. A lot of my clients, like they have some, lots of real estate and they make good money. And their accountants have them paying tax at their highest tax rate every year on that money. Literally, it goes into your ordinary tax rate. It's considered passive, which just means that you don't have to pay social security tax on it. And I'm talking about if you're a traditional renter like, or, or a landlord, hey, I'm a landlord, there are some nuances if you're Airbnb and things like that. But for the most part, I am just paying ordinary income tax on it. I make money. I'm paying whatever the more I make, the more they take. It's going into my highest bracket. So if I make a couple hundred thousand and I have this extra $8,000, it goes right into whatever bracket that is. Let's say it's 24%. Ouch. Plus my state. Ouch. Right? You could be giving up a third of it. So what if we don't want to do that? So let's backtrack and remember how we are walking through that, that, that rental property. And I'm just going to call out a few items. I noticed a good, let's just say that I noticed the roof. Great roof. I noticed the cabinets. I noticed the, uh, all the landscaping. I noticed landscaping. Let's say that I noticed, oh, the new driveway. And I noticed the carpet. I'll put the carpet up here so that we don't get too far low, right? So I noticed those things. So I'm just gonna draw a line here. I noticed these things. People that understand depreciation and, and deal with businesses know that that carpet there's no way it's going to make it 27 and a half years. The IRS, if, if, if you chose to do this 27 and a half years on that residential property, the IRS is going to charge you tax when you sell it on that same amount that you depreciated at the rate of up to 25%, your ordinary rate capped at 25%. So most people talk about depreciation recapture as being at 25%. Let me figure this out. I didn't put the R in there. I have carpet. I did it the East Coast way. It was cop it. No, I have to put an R in there. Cop it. So let's just say that I have that carpet for 10 years. It's going to look like hell. There's no way that it has value. Why am I paying tax on that? Plus, why am I only writing it off a small portion at, at 27 and a half years? You know dang well that that carpet has a useful life. Even the IRS says this, by the way. The IRS says that the useful life of carpet is five years, not 27 and a half. Why are you writing it off at 27 and a half? Please explain that to me. The answer is your accountant doesn't know how to write it off at five years under these circumstances. And yes, you can write it off at five years. I'll show you a secret. You can actually write it off in one year. The whole thing, whole value of that carpet, one year. 
But Toby, what if it's like 10,000 bucks? Mm -hmm. Write it off, 168K bonus depreciation. We'll get there in a second. Write the whole thing off. But let's stop. We're looking at the roof. Beautiful new roof. And you're thinking, oh, five years? No, that roof is going to last a long time. The IRS is going to say it's going to last all 27 and a half years. That roof's going to be there for a while. You may have to replace it. And when you replace it, again, accountants drive me bonkers on this stuff. You're supposed to write off the amount that you've never written off. So like, let's say that we're halfway in, you've written off half the roof and you have to replace it. I'm taking the second half, the rest of that 27 and a half years, I'm gonna write it off right now because I took it out of service. And then I put a new roof on and I start writing that one off over 27 and a half years. That's how you're supposed to do it. But we're not there yet, 27 and a half years. Then we look at the cabinets. How long do you think cabinets last? Generally speaking, I think it's seven years. Cabinets, yeah, you're probably gonna have to replace them every so often. But the IRS says, useful life, seven years. How about the landscaping? Hmm. How often do you think you have to redo your yard? So if you're a, a landlord, how often do you think you're gonna be redoing that yard? Every 10 years, every 20 years? What do you think it is? The IRS says 15 years. So your shrubs, your sidewalks, all that stuff. You're planting a bunch of trees and everything else. Your fence. It's all going to last about 15 years, according to the IRS. This is important. Then we get to our, can you write off a driveway? How long is that driveway going to be there? Guess what? 15 years. And you're going to say, but wait, it's going to be there a lot longer. So <laughs> when I buy equipment for a company, I can write it off in the first year under section 179 or under 168K. So I wrote off 100% of it. It's still being used. It might be used for 10 years, 20 years. Doesn't matter. The IRS says here's its useful life. A car has five years useful life. A plane has seven years useful life. They're going to last a lot longer. It just means here's the portion that you get to write it off. Again, your house on your rental property says 27 and a half years. That doesn't mean in 27 and a half years it falls over. It's still going to be there in 27 and a half years. If it's non-residential, by the way, it's 39 years. You have a building, commercial building. Maybe it's, uh, what is it? Mini storage and things like that. They're going to be there for a long time. Office building, it's going to be there longer than 39 years. But the IRS allows you to write off the structural component over 39 years. If it's residential, 27 and a half years. But we do it incorrectly 90 plus percent of the time. They don't break these things out. And the reason is because it costs money to break it out. The accountants oftentimes put their wallet in your back pocket. Oh, it doesn't, it's not worth it to do a cost segregation. That's the precise term that we're going to use to discuss breaking this away from the structural home, like the actual structure of the house, the roof and the structure. the walls, that's all 27 and a half years too. Hopefully you guys can see that. Hopefully it's not completely going up, but it's 27 and a half years structural. We want to break the other items out. There's electric stuff that can be done. We could be breaking out all of the components, everything from your cabinets to your, you know, your, your, what is it? Your countertops, everything along those lines. We can even be breaking out certain types of plumbing. It's either going to be 27 and a half years, it could be something less. Now, here's why this is so important. On average, and we've done quite literally thousands. It's about 30% on average, maybe a little higher, depending on the group that you use. I've seen the cost segregation breaking items out break the, what we call the tangible property, the stuff that has a useful life less than 27 and a half years. I've seen that as high as 80%. Things like mobile home parks or somebody brings in and puts in structural for RV parks and stuff like that, all that stuff, like most of the pad work and all the electric. 
hundred, like that's deductible. I've seen people buy properties in just over a million bucks and get a $900,000 deduction in year one. Now in single family residential, it's probably about 30%. And it's not 30% of the purchase price. It's 30% of the depreciable amount. That tends to be what it is. So let, what, what do we say? 30% of, of 275, whatever that is, probably about 80 some thousand, right? So we're looking at it and we're saying, or actually, <laughs> what would it be? Nine, 900,000. Yeah, <laughs> something like that. Right around 900,000, or so, so it should be 90,000. So it'd be about $90,000 that we'd get as a deduction in year one. How do we get there? We break it into its, its, its portions, and let's just say it's 90,000. So I'm just gonna say, hey, normally we're taking the, the, that 75. Now we're gonna do what's called the cost sag. So we cost sag, and we have what's called 1245 property and 1250 property. The 1245 is the stuff that is anything that's below, it's not structural. It's tangible property that we're gonna write off over a period of years. I'm not gonna to try to make you remember that. What I'm gonna just do is call it cost seg of five, seven, and 15 year property. And then we're gonna have a 27 and a half year property. And we'll just put in amounts. So I use 275. So let's just say it's 90,000. Hopefully you guys can see that, 90,000. And then that portion would be 275 minus the 90,000. So what would that be? 185. And excuse me if I do my math wrong, if I'm doing it in my head. But I think it's 185. That you would still divide up by 27 and a half years. So you're still going to get depreciation. You're going to get your normal depreciation. But in that first year, we could make an election. We can either keep the property as five, seven, or 15 year, or we can accelerate any one of those categories or all of those categories. And you could take bonus depreciation. Right now, you can bonus depreciate any item that's 20 years or less, 100%. I'm not misstating, 100%. You could write it off right now. You bought that property this year, you could have a $90,000 immediate deduction plus your regular depreciation. What ends up happening is the same facts, just think of it like this, you don't even need anything else. I made $18,000 net, I immediately take off my 90, and then it's about $3,000 different, so what was our amount? So we'd end up with another 7,000 or so. Again, I'm just doing loose math. It's some, it's pretty darn close. So what that, what's that going to allow me to do is have a $97,000 deduction against $18,000 of net. So what is that going to put us at? 97 minus eight. So about $79,000 of loss. And you know what you do with that? You offset your other passive income. The $79,000 doesn't just disappear. You can carry it forward and wipe out future years of rental income. What's the benefit to you doing this? At a minimum, it kept me from paying tax on that $18,000 minus the depreciation. It kept me from paying tax on $8,000 a year. Depending on what type of person you are and what type of activities you're engaged in, both you and your spouse, technically, I could unlock this entire amount and wipe out your other W-2 income. Technically, this would be considered passive. But if you are doing Airbnb or VRBO or other short-term rentals, this could be ordinary loss and offset your W-2. Or if you're a real estate professional, you could use that against it. Or if you make less than $100,000 a year and you actively participate in real estate, you could write off up to $25,000 of that against your other income. I'm not even talking against rental. I'm talking like, let's say for example, this is you, you're making $150,000 a year and you manage to do this. 
there would have been $8,000 that would have been taxable on top of your 150. You don't have to pay tax on that anymore. But what if you qualified as a real estate professional? You or your spouse. And you qualified. So the tax return would qualify. You'd get that $79,000 deduction against your 50. You're now only paying tax on, under those circumstances, what would that be? Uh, da, 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 about 69000 See what I'm saying? All of a sudden, it makes a massive impact. What was it? 61000 Or no, 71000 Add that up. Yeah, about 71000 Math. Ugh. Attorney math. I just add zeros to things, right? But this is going to have, it's just literally going to cut your tax bill. Not by half, because remember, the more you make, the more they take. It's going to cut your tax bill by about two-thirds. Because you're taking money out of the top brackets. That first 8000 was the most expensive money you were getting. And then you're just going down to the next bracket, taking that, etc. So it's just little something like this could put tens of thousands of dollars in your pocket. I've seen clients literally save up to $180,000 in year one. It's called cost seg segregation. And you couple it up, depending on your facts, depending on your activities, there are nuances. So for example, rental property is considered passive unless it's not rental property. It's not rental property if your average stay is seven days or less. Now it's basically a hotel, they call it an active trader business or a trader business. And then your ability to take that deduction is gonna, it's gonna be an ordinary deduction. All of a sudden I can write it off against my W-2 income just like if I was uh, materially participating in another business. So I just used a, a keyword, that material participation. So you have an Airbnb and you're running it, you get to write that off against your other income. You're not running it, it's just a passive business. No, don't different than if I was like a silent owner in a pizza shop. My brother opens up a pizza shop. I don't work at the pizza shop. I'm just an investor. I'm 50% owner, let's just say. End of the year, it makes 100 grand. That's passive income to me. This is passive loss if it's rental loss, and I could use this to offset my 100,000. That's how passive income and passive losses work. Passive losses only offset passive income. But if we are not in passive, so non-passive loss, would be if you are a real estate professional or if it's not rental activity and you materially participate. So it's an Airbnb and I materially participate. Now I'm not gonna do a deep dive on things like material participation. There's actually seven tests and I'll just tell you the ones that are most relevant. If you self-manage, you don't even have to worry about hours. So if you have an Airbnb, let's say you bought an Airbnb in December of this year do you know that you could bonus depreciate all those items and take them as a deduction against your this year's taxes? If you had that $79,000 deduction, guess what? Even if you only had it around for a month, you still get to take that deduction against your W-2 income if you are the one running it. If you have somebody else doing substantial activities on the property, like cleaning in between rentals, so you have an Airbnb and you have somebody coming in there cleaning, you have to do, you and your spouse have to do 100 hours total between the two of you, and nobody else could have spent 100 hours. So again, you buy it at the end of the year, it's gonna be almost impossible to do your 100 hours. There's no way, unless you're working full time on that thing. It's much easier just to be the only one running it if you buy towards the end of the year. The other test that's relevant when we talk about rental properties is 500 hours between you and a spouse, 500 hours. And that's really reserved for people that have portfolios where one spouse is working on the portfolio and managing those properties. We treat all those properties as one group and we add up all their hours and we follow the test. The test technically is under 469C7 of the code. And it's really simple. It's one spouse has to be in a real estate trader business. They need to be an owner, part owner of at least 5%. And you can add up all their time and they have to do 750 hours in a real estate trader business. Not your real estate, any real estate trader business, which could be construction, development, redevelopment, wholesaling, you know, whatever. Managing your own properties could even qualify. Being a real estate agent would qualify. Being a broker would qualify, right? Any of those activities, one spouse has to do 750 hours and it has to be 
the majority of their personal service time. So if you spend, you know, 2,000 hours working, it needs to be 750 hours and more than anything else you did. So if you did one job and you did 1,200 hours, uh, 1,250 hours being a, let's just say that you're a barber, and then you did 750 hours on real estate, you would not qualify because even though you hit the 750 hours of real estate, you did not do more than 50% of your time. So that one spouse has to qualify. So the easiest is if you have one spouse who's out working, doing all this stuff, and the other spouse is managing your portfolio and spends at least 750 hours. You do that, you're as good as gold. You pass prong number one. Prong number two is you materially participate on your real estate. Again, as a group, lump it all together, your rental real estate. This is important. I don't, again, I don't want to go too far down. You'll see that there's lots of little nuances, which is why you talk to people who know it. But it's rental properties. We treat them all as one. Assuming you don't have an active trader business that's renting one of those properties, we keep it all together. Or if we have Airbnbs, again, there's workarounds. But if, if it's an Airbnb and it's less than seven days or less, then that's not rental property anymore. If we need it, we can group it back in. There's a, there's a technique for doing so. I don't want to get too deep. But you'd set up a corporation, rent it to the corporation long, and let the corporation lease it short. And then the corporation then would be the hotel operator and you would just be a landlord. So there's ways to do it. But let's say you materially participate on your group of property. Again, it's the three tests that are relevant is the you do everything. Nobody else does anything of substantial. Somebody else is doing other stuff like cleaning and, and maintaining it, even managing it. You're spending more time than them and at least 100 hours. Or you just hit 500 hours between you and a spouse so let's say you have one spouse who's managing your portfolio, does 500 hours there, does 750 hours actively managing them. They are a real estate professional. Your whole return qualifies. So let's say you're a doctor, you're making a million bucks. Now we can unlock all these losses as non-passive. So we can offset your million dollars. And every dollar you're offsetting is a pretty, it's 37% federal plus your state. So it becomes a really positive thing and powerful thing to lower your tax bill by doing cost segs and qualifying as a real estate professional. Just as another idea, and you can see there's lots of videos on our site that talks about things like this. Let's say that I'm a doctor, million bucks, and I need to get a big deduction. What you might wanna do is at the end of the year, every year, the last quarter, is buy an Airbnb property, self-manage it for at least those two or three months, make sure it's seven days or less, Take all the depreciation in the first year, just suck all that depreciation for all those items, write it off against your million bucks. You get to write it off as non-passive. Boom, I've just lowered my tax bill by tens of thousands of dollars. And then come January 1st, find somebody else to manage it for you. Say, hey, you can manage my Airbnb or rent it long. Just do it as a month to month rental. All we care about is Airbnb is a trader business. And when you are a trader business, let's say I was a pizza shop uh, and I bought some equipment at the end of the year, I get to write it off so long as I put it into service before the end of the year. I could write the whole thing off. I don't care whether it was in service for a week. As long as it was in service, I get to write it off. Well, your house and these items, the seven, 15 year, five year, those are all same rule. I get to write them off 100% if they were in service before the end of the year. So even if I did it the last month, the last two weeks, whatever, if I have an Airbnb, for the last two weeks, I managed it, I did everything. I can suck that depreciation out, offset my ordinary income and lower my tax bill substantially every year just by doing that. That's why I keep saying this is the number one tax loophole for real estate investors. Clearly, far and away, and I don't know why people don't do it. Cost segregations, I work with great people. I've done thousands of these. They're not that expensive. What I always do is I, I say, hey, first off, I work with people that'll do it for free. They will look at your analysis and do that for free. They won't do the cost seg where they send an engineer out and break these components. That's actually what they have to do. They don't do that for free, but they will tell you what the benefit will be. They're very, very good. They've done thousands and thousands and thousands all over the country. They're able to tell you eerily close to what the final figure is, what they believe it will be. So they could say, hey, Toby, you're going to get a $100,000 deduction. And on your tax return, that is worth $40,000. Well, 
and it's going to cost you $2,000 to do the cost seg. Would you spend $2,000 to save $40,000? Yeah. Now let's say it was the same scenario and they said, hey, we're going to get you a $10,000 deduction. It's going to be worth $4,000. Would you spend $2,000 to get a $4,000 deduction? Probably not. Like, let's be real. That's great. There's still a net return, but am I going to come out of pocket for it? No, I want to see probably seven times return on my dollars. So if I spend $2,000, I want to see at least $14,000 of tax savings, not deduction, tax savings. That's why your situation, your facts are your facts. You make sure somebody's looking at those facts and they could tell you, here is the benefit. Easy, far and away, number one tax loophole. And here's the punchline. You ready? When you make the election to break your property out like this, it literally says, it's called a 3115, and it's a change of election form. It says you are changing from an impermissible method to a permissible method. In other words, when you go from just doing the 27 and a half years to breaking it out into its five, seven, and 15 year property and 27 and a half years, you are going from the impermissible, hey, we'll let you do it. You're not supposed to do it, but we'll let you do it because you're paying us more. You're going from an impermissible method of doing just 27 and a half years. You're going impermissible. I'm running off my carpet over 27 and a half years. You're not supposed to do that. And you're going to the permissible, which is, hey, I'm breaking things out as I'm supposed to do. That's the punchline. You're doing what you're supposed to do in the first place. They let you do the stuff that's going to hurt you because it makes them more money. That's the truth. You can look at it, 3115. Now, you don't even have to file that form if it's your first year of ownership. You can make this change any point in the, in the life of the property. So if I have had property for five years and I say, to you're sitting there and you're going, you're getting pissed, you're looking at your account and you're ready to like, what? why, why didn't they tell me this? They probably didn't know or they thought that cost segregations were gonna to be too expensive, so they didn't even think to ask you. They never did the analysis. In taxes, there's really only three rules. You ready? Real easy. Three rules. Number one, calculate. Number two, calculate. Number three, calculate. Get your chalk out, get your pencil out, whatever, and crunch some numbers. Once you do that, you can determine whether or not your course of action is proper or whether you need to do something else. So if I'm doing a cost segregation study and I see it's going to save you 50 grand, $50,000 in tax savings, then I'll probably do it if, it, if the cost is, is reasonable and I'm getting a big enough return. Here's more fun. You can cost seg on a property that you sold this year. You can actually do that before the tax filing in the following year. So technically you can cost seg properties that you bought or that you've had for years you could, you could still do it on your taxes up until your return is due plus extensions. So if your return was due in April, you could make a cost seg for that year, that tax year, last year, all the way up until mid-October when the, when the return's actually due. What if I filed the return? You could still amend. What if I had, I've had the property for three years? So what? We could still do it. Do I go back three years? Nope, we're gonna capture all that depreciation in the year that I changed my accounting method. So I have a prop portfolio of hundreds of properties. My partner and I never really know until the summer how much money we're actually gonna make. My law partner here, Clint Coons, we always get together and we look at it and we start, all right, so we have a bunch of office buildings, we have some warehouses, we have a lot of single families, we have uh, mobile home parks, we have apartment buildings. You really, until, like, we can look at the numbers, but until everything's kind of done, we go through all the books, we look at, are there any adjustments we can make? Then we know whether we have profit. So we might be sitting in July and you realize, oh, shoot, we have a $300,000 profit. Okay, pick a couple properties that we can cost seg to wipe that out. You could do that. You're saying, wait a second, I can do a cost seg all the way up into October? and lower my taxes for last year? Yes, because you pay your taxes, let's, you know, whatever the year it is, you, you make money in year one, you pay taxes on it by April 15th of year two, you file your return by October 15th of year two.
but it's still year one's taxes, right? We're always behind when we're ta filing our taxes. So you have an extra 10 and a half months to make that election. So yeah, you can still do it. You have a, you have, you're on extension, easy. Even if you filed your return, still look at it. See whether or not it's gonna save you some money. Now the 100% bonus depreciation, the code section is 168K. It does move. It's gonna go from 100 to 80 and on down under the ta uh, Tax Cut and Jobs Act over a period of years. So at some point it might come down Generally speaking, they keep it around 50% at a minimum, but they keep pushing it up to 100. I think it's going to stay at 100. And it just allows us to write things off faster. Hey, I'm still going to write it off over, instead of writing it off over 27 and a half years, I'm just going to write it off right now, a big chunk of it, 30% of it. Sometimes 40%, sometimes 50. It depends on your property, but I would say very comfortably the average is right around 30%. And even if I sold a property last year, I can still go back and cost seg it if it's going to save me money because get this, you have depreciation recapture on that 27 and a half year. If I've owned that property for five years, I don't have any recapture on that five-year property. I got the write-off and I don't have to recapture it. It's going to save me in taxes. So we had one sale. It was a building that was owned for five years. They bought it for 2.5, sold it for three. Their tax bill would have been, like literally would have been about 270 to, uh, it was right around 280 and they knocked it down to right around two. The tax savings was $78,000. And they did it right before they sold. You could even do it after you sell, but you have to have access to the property. But that's how powerful this loophole is. And I say loophole loosely because it's not really a loophole. It's doing it the way you're supposed to do and you're being rewarded for doing it the way you're supposed to instead of just following along the rest of the sheeple and doing 27 and a half years or 39 years. If you like this type of information, please share it with others. If you know anybody who's a real estate investor who might be doing it wrong, share it with them. Please subscribe. Please kick that little bell, like click on that little bell because it lets you know when new videos come out. And then this is the most important part. If you have comments or if you have suggestions or you want clarity, please ask us. Myself and I have a whole team go through the questions. So if you want clarity, I'll give you clarity. If you want a referral to somebody who does uh, cost segregations, I'll give you a referral to somebody who does cost seg and they will give you a free analysis. You come through us, we get it as a courtesy because we kick so much business to these groups. The one that I like the most is a CPA firm that all they do is energy credits and cost segregations. That's their whole practice. That's all they do year in and year out. I love that because they're so focused. Thank you for joining me. Hope you learned something.